All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome back to True Correct Loser. I hope you're doing well. So, folks, today we are going to go over a number of upcoming trials that all seem to be happening in 2021. I don't know if there's ever been a time that I can remember where more big trials that have the public attention are all coming to a head at the same time, and you got to think, A lot of it has to do with the complications that COVID poses to do a court appearance. There are a few options we've seen. They can do the remote Zoom type option where everybody's up on the screen and their little square comes off as looking like a sick version of the Brady Bunch. Like, here's the story of a child trafficker. Dershowitz kept his underwear firmly on. And if you don't want to do the Zoom remote on a screen route, we have seen some in-court proceedings and they're just a nightmare. They kick everybody non-essential out of the courtroom. The lawyers are wearing masks. No one can hear them. Everybody's sweating profusely. The judge is behind a plexiglass bulletproof cage. The lawyers are <laughs> And so I think a lot of these are just because of all that. They've said, let's just put it off until 2021. And so I'm going to go over a number of these. We got Scott Peterson, Ghislaine Maxwell, The Daybells, and then Mark Howerton, which Mark Howerton probably has the least public um, attention. But I think that one is really interesting, and I've been thinking about it a lot. But without further ado, let's start with Scott Peterson. He had a hearing on Friday. It was the remote Brady Bunch style. Everybody's up on a screen. He was sitting right in the middle wearing a big old blue COVID mask. He looked like COVID Hannibal Lecter. I was watching it going, are they they discussing whether to redo the penalty phase or what? And I was watching on a YouTube video and it seemed like everyone in the comments, no one really knew. It was like, wait, is this? And then it became at least clear to me, it was like, oh, they're talking about the whole retrial. And it wasn't, it wasn't if it should happen. The whole tone of the defense, prosecution, and the judge, the way I understood it, was not if, but when. So it is looking like, I was confident enough to put it on this list, it is looking like, people, we are going to see a Scott Peterson 2 in 2020. They were t- the judge was talking during the hearing was doing timeline stuff and he was asking the defense how long do you need for that and the defense was saying well that's a pretty big deal I think we need thirty days or I can't remember exactly what he said but it was a significant amount of time I think we need a month and the prosecution goes no 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 we can't do a month for that if you remember the first time around it took three and a half months to select a jury for this thing so. If you do a month for that, it's going to be... And so when I heard that, three and a half months to select a jury for this thing, it kind of hit me that for the Scott Peterson sequel, really, it's all jury selection. Can you imagine how meticulous they are going to go through that jury selection? Because as we've seen through the 15 years with people that watch the podcasts and... Everything about Scott Peterson has been meticulously gone over. And it seems to me that either people hear the evidence and the circumstantial evidence either sways them against Scott or it doesn't. The the big um, faults for, I think, why he'll get a new trial is the jur- one of the jury members said that she was against the death penalty, but in this case she could make an exception. And then, I guess, the lack of physical evidence. So, I mean, it could get really interesting. This is one of the biggest high-profile cases of this generation. And so what I guess I'm interested in is, is it going to just go completely as big as it was the first time? I mean, why wouldn't it, right? All of the people that watched it the first time, you got to think, are going to watch it this second time. And... Who knows where they're going to have the trial. And like I said, I think everything with that one is going to come down to jury selection. How does the story affect that individual juror? 
is what it's going to come down to. And it is mind-blowing and surreal for me to think about that in a mere matter of months, 12 people could be sitting in a jury room that smells like old coffee and gross takeout food, deciding whether Scott Peterson, Peterson? Scott Peterson gets to go free or not. And he would have gone from death penalty to free if it happens. You know, I still think it's an uphill battle for his defense, but we will see. I'll keep you in the loop. All right, moving on to Ghislaine Maxwell. The big documents came out. I'm sure you've read a news story or two on them, but as you can imagine, it was a classic deposition where she violently and frantically denied, 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 which is not um, surprising at all. What do you think she's going to do? Here's a couple of my favorite lines, but then I'm going to tell you, I don't think the story with these documents coming out is anything in the documents, but I'll tell you what I mean. So a couple of my favorite lines as this, as the deposition, as you go through the deposition. And so here's just like a little act out of how it reads. Were you ever in an orgy with, boop, like it's blacked out, the name's blacked out. Were you ever in an orgy with, boop? No, I was never in an orgy with, boop. That's one of Virginia's many lies that she tells. Okay, were, were, you, were you ever in, boop's helicopter? Yes, I was on the helicopter twice. And so it's, she doesn't, of course, just never recruited, bare, you know, she, the way she was saying, she barely even saw a female during that time in her life of any age. Just, it was like comical. One, at one point they show a picture of her and they said, is this a picture of you? And she goes, I don't know. At one point she says, I can't think of anything I have done that is illegal. Um, but what I, I, in the news stories that I've been reading about it, they did leave out one thing. She did admit to something, and I haven't seen it in any of the big papers that have written about this deposition. Hundreds of pages in, after just really denying to a point that it's comical. I figured she was going to ask Michelle at any moment. She finally did admit to once in a while she would give career advice. Everybody faints. Ah! <laughs> so she gives career advice. But like I said, I don't think any, I don't think her just uh, denying over and over and over again is the story. The story is the absolute mind-blowing waste of time that whole deposition, the process of getting that whole deposition out was. So let me set this up. They went back and forth for months on this thing. I could have made a video every two days, but I just was bored with it. I was like, the hell with this. And then I didn't even look into it for a couple weeks. And then I would be like, well, I don't want to totally lose where I'm at with the case. And I'd check in. I'd check in with my guy, Bennett, that's going through all the filings. And it would just be like, no, they're still just talking whether to unseal or to seal. And then it went from, okay, we're going to unseal it. And then all of the emails that went out to the John Doe's, I mean, think of all the time and money, the judges sitting there, all the high-priced lawyers, they go through this whole thing. It goes to an appeals court. They decide, no, 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 we're going to put it out. So after that, all of that, I mean, months of every, all these smart people with law degrees going, nah, nah, nah. after all of that, what they decided was, okay, it comes out, but with all of the names blacked out. And then so they put it out, and immediately everybody can figure out who the blacked out names are. So let me just reiterate, after months of the judge and the lawyers and all of these John Doe's just going back and forth and time and motions and all of this stuff, and the result is that it just comes out and everybody gets to see. Because like all the names were blacked out, but there was a 
like a table of contents with all of the names that there were also blacked out, but the table of contents, the way that I understand it, the table of contents was in alphabetical order. So people that were good at puzzles and stuff that have that, you know, were able to figure it out. <laughs> so after all of that, the sealed, the unsealed, okay, we're going to put it out, but we're going to black out all the names. It just was all for nothing. And I guess it's part of the evidence. So now, you know, the hell with those documents. Looking forward, I'm, I'm looking at this whole thing and going, what is the evidence against Ghislaine? It's, I think that they, the uh, prosecution has an uphill battle with this thing. Even Virginia Roberts' lawyer, I think it was in the New York Times, had a statement almost um, talking about just how much of a nothing the big documents were. She said something like, uh, this is just a part of the evidence. More is going to come out. Because I think a lot of people were like, what is this? This is just a, what pretty much all depositions are when people just sit down and go, no, no, never did, never had an orgy with that guy, maybe was on his helicopter, never saw Clinton on the island. That was also a big one. And when she, that's another interesting part. She said Clinton, she never saw Clinton on the island. Clinton was not on the island. And that name wasn't left out. When she was saying Clinton wasn't on the island, Clinton's name was not blacked out, but I think that it's like when you're solving one of those, like a puzzle to figure out what's the names, alphabetical order, that helped everybody because Clinton appeared and you could see it and then you could go to the table of contents of alphabetized names and then that gave you a starting place and I don't know, just something so funny to me about all of the procedure okay sealed unsealed sealed appeals court and then the whole thing comes out and it's just completely unsealed all the names bob dole was in there um but i guess my last point on that one is when when i was at her first appearance it was the zoom thing up on the screen and they were talking about um deadlines for having all the evidence turned in I remember sitting there thinking this is an uphill battle for the prosecution all this all of this stuff happened years ago it seems like a lot of it is going to be her word against Ghislaine's type of thing and so she also not only had the money the the best lawyer money could buy after that she hired a super duper lawyer and so now she has the super lawyer on top of her other lawyer team. The evidence is old. This deposition was nothing. So I, I guess my conclusion on that one is now what I'm interested in is what other evidence do they have against old Ghislaine Maxwell? All right, moving on. That, oh, yeah, one last thing. Ghislaine's trial is starting July 12th, my 35th birthday. All right, so we're going to move on to the Daybell. The Daybell disaster, Lori and Chad, since I've talked about it last, Mark Means, one of my favorite characters in the whole thing. If you remember, he's got his whole saying on his website is don't get thrown under the bus. It's kind of funny to t think about Ghislaine's lawyers versus Lori's lawyer. She's got super lawyer, you know, defended Osama bin Laden's right hand man, all of these. And then Mark Means is like, I live in a bus now. I mean, don't get thrown under the bus. He tweeted, Mark Means tweeted like a week ago that, Pretty much he doesn't have any money. He tweeted, hey, everybody, I don't, the, we don't have the resources that the state has, so I'm really going to need, in the, the, he called it the people of knowledge. I'm going to need the people of knowledge to come forward. I, I just love that. I mean, the fact that the guy with a picture of a bus on his website that's unimaginably huge, like that takes up the whole screen on every page of his website, doesn't have any money. 
I, was, I went to his website to think, what if he switched his slogan to go, don't live in your bus, hire me. And so they also wanted to combine, we heard that, that Idaho wanted to combine these trials. It was supposed to go down, this one, the whole Daybell thing was supposed to go down in January, so in a couple months, but it seems like it might get delayed. And I heard that Chad's side does not want to join up. And Lori's, Mark Mean and Lori want to join up. So that could be Mark Means is going, yeah, I think we need to join. His suit like falls apart. I think we need to join up. And the bizarre thing with this one is there is no murder charge. And that's strange because pretty much everybody involved got murdered. So my questions are, is Idaho blowing it? Where are the murder charges? What's happening? You know, I don't know. It's a strange one. Are they going to try them on the destruction of evidence and then add the murder charge later? You got to think at some point, since so many people got murdered, that they would just say, okay, maybe we don't have the evidence that we want or, or maybe we don't feel great about the murder case but we're gonna try we're just gonna charge him with it and we're gonna see how it goes i think at a certain point that's gonna be the move do i have anything else on the day bells i can't believe mark means is broke it's so funny okay and then last but not least people Mark Howerton. And if you don't know about Mark Howerton, uh, I did a video on it maybe a couple weeks ago, but it is sort of a George Hughley situation. He was dating a college student. She was pretty much dating two guys at once. A football player turned chubby weed dealer and Mark Howerton, which it was a star high school baseball player that turned into a roided out selfie taker. And so she's dating both of them. Mark Howerton is not, um, you know, everybody is not happy with the three-way dating that she's got going. She, he threw all of her clothes in a tree, if you remember. But they go to a music festival. They take a bunch of molly, which is the detail that could really change the whole case. They take a bunch of Molly, they go to a music festival, the both guys that she's dating are there. It's in, you know, it's a that horrible love triangle energy. Nobody I don't think is happy. Everybody is on Molly. And another huge chunk of the case is that the football boyfriend turned chubby weed dealer testified to the grand jury that he saw Mark Howerton pick the girl up, bring her to the car, and put her in. That turned out to not be true. He made that up to the grand jury. And then it went on that quickly the story is then they went to some gas station and had sex and then they were driving home and she stopped breathing and he drove to the hospital. That timeline didn't make sense after they really dug into it. So he goes, actually, we didn't drive to the gas station to have sex. We drove to a different place to have sex. I choked her a little bit in a sex way, not in a killing way. And then he drove, they drive, he's driving home. She quits breathing, drives to the hospital. They start working on her. They bring Mark into a, the chapel church room at the hospital, and he gives a mollied out impromptu interrogation in the church hospital. The reason, it goes to trial. Well, actually, they didn't even arrest him that night. Then a uh, couple months, I think, if I remember right, a couple months after the um, autopsy comes back, it says she was Beat to death. He gets arrested. They do a trial. It's a hung jury because I think the Molly, she had enough Molly in her body that anything could happen. And so that is a big 
bummer for the defense because no matter how, if they get an expert to say, look, she was, her head was punched a bunch of times. The defense can always say, yeah, but she was on so much Molly, who knows what happened in there. So that is a big point for me that makes it interesting. This guy who I think did it might get off because of Molly and might get off because of the ex football player, boyfriend turned weed dealer, him lying to the grand jury, those two things. If he gets off, I will say, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, this is the first trial that I can remember where if the person, which I think did it, if they get off, I will have the opinion of like, I mean, yeah, it just was totally botched. You can't, you can't uh, lie to a grand jury and say you saw your love rival pick up you know, the victim and shove her in the car and it changes the whole story. It makes the whole thing look like a setup. And then, I don't know, with the, with the drugs and the, they had a Molly expert come in and say, yeah, the amount of Molly she tested for, it's like, who knows what will happen. So I think, like I said, I think that one's going down in January. I'm going to really be interested in that one. It's almost like if George Hughley had a couple things that really made it interesting. And so, I don't know, we'll see. But I think that's all I got. Interesting trials coming up in 2021. Hopefully it, COVID normalizes so it's not the... And everyone's sweating and just a total disaster. But I'm going to cut it off there. I hope you guys are doing well. Um, thanks to everybody that gave me well wishes for my bathroom situation. Late last week, a pipe broke in between my bathroom and uh, the bathroom in the people's apartment that live below us. So they ripped out his ceiling, the guy that lives below us, they ripped out his ceiling last week, figured out the problem, and then said, the only way we can fix it is we've got to take your to toilet off and then hopefully not that much, but knock a hole in the floor of your bathroom and so we can fix it. That all happened yesterday, so I uh, posted that picture. And the whole kind of stress around it is that we didn't know how much of our bathroom floor they were going to have to rip up. So they were thinking, if we, have, if we take the toilet off and just have to rip off a little, you know, we can fix that very quickly. But we've got to rip like the whole floor off the bathroom in our apartment was going to be a construction zone for a while. And so that's really what I was hoping not to be the case. We got lucky. I think they knocked, I don't know, maybe like a section like that. And it's totally fixed now. New tiles, new cement under the tiles. They did a great job. Got a great landlord in this apartment. So it's totally fixed. And yeah. I'm going to cut it off there. I'll see you guys next time. Why? Stabbing why? Shum.